Hello, nerds. Welcome to the Geek Girl Story Salon, where I talk to creatives from across disciplines and across the world about the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Jen Jackalone, lifelong storyteller and head geek in charge. We've got some great guests coming up, like Cullen Bunn, writer of the Harrow County Comics, and Star Trek writer Una McCormack. So be sure to smash that like and subscribe button to stay up to date on the heaping helpings of brain food coming your way, courtesy of our partners fleetoffandoms.com and Ilva Publishing, an independent publisher of women's fiction. As I know many of you are, I'm a big fan of sci-fi's The Magicians, and I've been really excited about getting today's guest on the show. You most likely will recognize her as Katie Orloff Diaz, the sultry but damaged magic school dropout. But you probably didn't know that in addition to acting and singing, and yes, we all loved those musical episodes, uh, she's a director, a life coach, a songwriter, and a passionate advocate for social causes ranging from feminism and LGBTQ rights to mental health. Welcome to the salon, Jade Taylor. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, and thank oh. you for the beautiful introduction. Thank you, and thank you for coming. And hello, Kitty. I was going to say, and my kitty wanted to say hello. Okay. Well. Is, All right. Puppy the cat. Oh. Cool. <laughs> Every witch has to have their black cat, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So he needed to make his appearance. I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you today. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to thank you for something else, which is uh, you introduced me to Desi Valentine. Ah, oh, yay. Desi and is a friend. I love him so he, much. He's amazing. He is a <laughs> delightful human. And he, we, he did the show a few weeks ago and we oh, had yay. such a good time. Good. Such an amazing time. So, oh, he's so happy. I, yeah, I just I just wanted to to personally thank you for that because oh, I, good. I was texting him with him this morning, so I'll have to let oh, him know. Okay. Yeah, that makes me really happy. He's, yeah. he's a dear, dear soul. Um, so we will get to talk to, about uh, the magicians in a bit because I don't want people at my window with torches and stuff. <laughs> um, Great. <laughs> but, um, you know, this is a show about story. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, like, when I discover an actor that uh, I like in a show, um, it's always just such a delight for me when I go and look on their social media and I find that they're hitting on all these other cylinders. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm sort of a multidisciplinary person myself. I was, you know, I did the singer songwriter thing in my 20s and then visual art in my 30s. And now I'm a writer and a screenwriter and podcast host and all this stuff. And I wonder, because for me, I wonder if you have this common experience did you kind of always know, even as a kid, that you were going to just do a lot of different stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I was always creative. And it was um, like, you know, sometimes people will deem it like, oh, they, they're they rambunctious. Or because they're like, we're just constantly needing to create something. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I was always that way. My my I was grateful that my mom was a creative and so she really supported the arts in that way. Mm -hmm. And I um, was really lucky to, to be doing it since I was three, three, four years old. Right. Right. See, like in many, many platforms, like we can get into that, but it's just, yeah, all, all over the place. And I think, I think really at the core of it, what it is, is, it, um, is needing to to create and and be fully expressed in whatever medium that comes through. And to me, it's just like the heart of a creative, mm -hmm. truly. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I wonder, and because I, I, you know, part of this is just me enjoying, like, picking things apart for my own understanding. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, I feel almost like expressing in different platforms, like, it almost like it hits, like, a different part of your brain or something. A thousand percent. I try to explain people are always, I don't know if you get this because you're all in all these um, different like disciplinaries as well, but I get this question of which one do you like more? And I'm like, that's like asking me which baby I love more. That doesn't, that's not how it works. They're different. Right. right. <laughs> you know, and I love them equally, but I love them in different ways because it hits, like you said, a different part of the brain, a different part of my soul when I'm, when I'm, acting and when I'm singing it hits this um this piece of me that's just like feels fully alive and fully expressed mm -hmm. and then there's this maternal thing like when I'm directing it's like I'm managing a lot of people and I'm like seeing all the like the nuances and the details and it's mm -hmm. there's the right brain and the left brain aspect of, of that where we're, we're mm -hmm. 
having to lean on both. And um, there's, there, yeah, I think to me, it's like, it's like apples and oranges. They're, they're both fruits that I love and I'm like, depends on the day. <laughs> so I hope that answers it, but yeah, it feels yeah, challenging. Yeah, but, absolutely valid. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in particular, and I think this, I, I asked, um, there's an, another actress I like, uh, Christina Tonteri Young, who was mm -hmm. in the Warrior Nun series on Netflix, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. which, you know, is terrific. I'm an unabashed, you know, Stan fangirl, whatever, mm -hmm. that show. I love um, that. But I asked her about, you know, what do you think the actor's role in storytelling is? Mm. And um her interesting her answer was really interesting she said it's almost like we're the point of the pencil i love that i think that's beautifully said yeah it's beautifully said yeah and i think so so often like i see actors that are like trying to edit mm -hmm. the writing and trying to like direct and be like no i think i should do it this way when i'm like no the director gets to direct me i'm like what and then i they're always like do you want to do it again i was like are you happy <laughs> This is your, like, are you, if you're happy, then I'm happy because I'm, this is where I get to be, I don't want to call it like a puppet in a negative connotation, but like, it's, I get to, to play and, and bring to life your vision. So I love that. Like the, like the point of a pencil that's beautifully, beautifully said. Yeah. And that, we don't, that's... what, what came before and created the pencil. <laughs> right. 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 It's like, there's all these, I mean, when you think about what is, goes into making a pencil, you know, there's the wood, there's the rubber, there's the metal that holds the eraser on, you know, there's all yeah. this stuff that has to happen, but still the story doesn't get out there if you don't have the point of the pencil. Exactly. I love that. I love that. That's beautifully said. Yeah. And I think of that too. Um, I think that that applies too to people who sing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who are not songwriters, but just who sing interpretively. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I think that's very, I think that applies in the same way because it's like, yeah, okay, the writer is going to write this, the director is going to direct this, the musical director is going to give you whatever directions they're going to give you. But you as the actor or the singer is still the one that actually makes us believe the story. Mm, you know I love, I mean? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I'm, it's it, to me, that's that's really what um, what it comes down to or what's at the heart of it is, mm it's it, just to me what i love about storytelling it's it's the art of like human understanding and human expression really at its core and if we can bring that to life and move people to feel things and to to be inspired by something it's like to me it's the the greatest gift for people to find their truth and find their expression mm -hmm. um because i think we live in a society where we're constantly told what we should do feel be like whether that's from our you know schooling or you know our parental programming or you know religious culture whatever it may be and so it's i think it's so valuable like art is just such a gift to to remind people of their truth and to be expressed in their truth and uh, and their humanity. Mm. It's my favorite. <laughs> Clearly. Um, so, I mean, would you say, and, and I ask this question a lot and I always find the, the answer is interesting because I've never gotten the same answer twice. Okay. Um, is that, would you, would you, dis, would you say that's your primary driver for the art, your art form? is is bringing people together and making people feel things you know is there an element of wanting to connect people is it about identity like what what are the drivers for you i appreciate you asking that question i love that question um for me you're having me think about it because i um like usually it comes down to what i usually say is it's all about humanity and um and i think and that can mean many things. For me, it's all about um, humanity in the sense of connection, humanity in the sense of connection to ourselves, humanity in the sense of, um, you know, being expressed as a human being or uh, accepting oneself as a human being, because I think it's, it's hard to be human sometimes. And I think oftentimes we're told that pain is a bad thing, but I love this, uh, this, um, for my, Cat is very excited today. Um, <laughs> I love this uh, this book. I think it was called the uh, the Art of Happiness. And uh, there's this quote that I or, or this phrase um, in it that I always 
reference because I think it's really powerful. And it goes back to what we're talking about mm-hmm. is um, I think it was the, it's about the Dalai Lama and Reverend Tutu. They're having a conversation and they start talking about how when a person is growing a baby inside of their womb, the baby is actually going through excruciating pain mm-hmm. to create life. But oftentimes we think pain is this negative thing and this bad thing and we resist it. And, and we're told like, um, like if we think about even when a parent sees a child like fall and they're like, oh no. And they're like making it a bad thing. And they're like, oh, okay. Unless like, or otherwise you could, you could respond in a different way and you can say, oh, it's okay. We always fall and we get back up and like, you're going to be okay. But we learned that pain is a bad thing. And we learned that pain like gets us love instead of um, just pain being part of like this human experience. And so to me, it's all about accepting one's humanity, accepting that we go through trials, tribulations, pain, trauma, all of these experiences. And how can we, A, find peace in that, in ourselves, and also um, relate to that in someone else. And to me, it's all about like empathy, understanding, compassion, for one another. And I think we just, we need more of that in this world. Mm-hmm. And um, so I use the word humanity to be all encompassing for this very broad thing that I have a hard time articulating mm-hmm. because it really is about, and there he goes, my dog, you know, the pets, the babies. Um, but it's, yeah, to me, it's a deeper love for humanity mm-hmm. that it's core. Mm-hmm. I think you're doing fine articulating it. So thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I know for me, um, you know, cause I, I asked this question a bunch of times and then realized yeah, tell me. I would love to hear your perspective. I, I, I do think it is for me personally, um, a kind of connective tissue that I'm putting into the world. Mm. Even when I'm writing something that seems sort of, frivolous um it's still something that reflects my particular values and it's still something that you know most of my protagonists if uh, most of what i write is pretty queer not all of it but uh, anything i write is going to have a sprinkle of glitter on it probably um (laughs) it's just you know more fun um but (laughs) always but you know part of what i feel like is like you just you tell good stories and you know if there's if there are queer people in them or there are people discussing these kinds of things that's just not you know making it the whole point of the narrative but just making it part of it like that's something you know maybe there's somebody out there reading that that's going to go oh okay maybe this is not as different from me as i thought yeah it normalizes it i was oh, who was i talking about this the other day I was talking about a particular show it won't, uh, it's not going to be at the moment, but I was talking about a show and how, um, oh, maybe it was Sensate, probably, because I love that show, but um, sure. great show. Um, but I was talking about how, like, there's certain shows that, like, talk about these things and normalize it. And, um, and I think there was another show that I was referencing, too, about, like, the queer characters, but it's just... Oh, in um, it's like an interesting one, but like Chicago Fire, for example, there was, or no, not Chicago Fire, Station Nineteen. That was it. Hmm. Station Nineteen. Um, I have some friends on that show, and um, I was talking about how they they don't make it a point to like point out the queerness, mm-hmm. but they just normalize it, and I think it's so vital because we look at 50 years ago, we were in a different, different time. And some people in some places in our country, unfortunately, are still living in that mentality and in that archaic, you know, way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's so vital that we are telling stories to normalize all of humanity, all of our uniqueness. I think that's another way to, to describe it for me mm-hmm. is at the core. It's like, I want to be celebrating the uniqueness of each and every one of us Mm -hmm. because so often we're going, Oh, well, like look at that thing on Instagram and like trying to be like something else. Mm -hmm. And I'm, we have 80 trillion unique cells in each of us. 
not like anyone else, literally not like anybody else. So why do we then try to be like someone else? So it's like, but can we also find the connectivity of the uniqueness plus our humanness? Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. So, I, so. That's my show. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, it's, I mean, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, even when you're telling a story, that's not like, you know, the deepest thing ever. It's still a way to connect with people. And it's, it's still, it still matters and means something. And it's like, you know, for me, it's on some level, it's a spiritual obligation. Like I have to do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Same, same, same. Yeah. And I always, I always look back and it's kind of like the, when we're trying to understand the pathology of a character and I'm sure as a writer for you, you're, you're looking at that all the time and I'm going, well, what is that driving force in me? And I think, you know, we can always look back at like, what was it in our childhood, in our life, in our experience? Mm-hmm. And I think so often we look at our childhood and the painful moments as things that were these negative things. But in fact, those are the things that drive us today. So how can we shift our narrative to actually be inspired by it? And like all the horrible things that I went through as a child, like made me actually want to fight for humanity. I'm like, oh, you know, not such a bad thing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, there's, there's this sense of like, um, there's, there's a sense of just wanting to, you know, to create because you have to, because, you know, it's like, to put something healing into the world in whatever way you can. A thousand percent, a thousand percent. And I think we need more people doing that. If we were all doing that, this world would be a different place, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would love to, there's, there's a lot I think going on in the culture now that's just so motivated by fear and, yeah. And, you know, I can't help but wonder to your point, um, what what would change if those people were creating and actually addressing that fear? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I do feel like we're in a new, it, it, like in this new paradigm. It, but it's interesting. It's like I, I've seen, like when we just look at humanity over hundreds, thousands of years, there's always this interesting like elevation but while that elevation is happening, there's also this dichotomy. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like it heightens the challenges and it it's like it heightens the darkness and it also heightens the light. Mm-hmm. And so although like there's this, the society is driven by fear in so many ways, it's also shining a light on the ways to change it. Mm-hmm. And so I just it's I find it really interesting that 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 happens. And I think. Um, it does feel like we're in this new, like this on this precipice of like, I don't know, this um, people are really trying to change things. They're really trying to seek for understanding and support. And, um, and I, I think it just, it requires, if you, like, I just, for those listening, like if you have this driving force to make a difference, to impact, to tell a story, to, to share, like to um, to choose love over fear, mm-hmm. like that to me, it's a ripple effect that continues to grow and grow and grow. And I think well, there's always going to be a polarity. There's always going to be darkness and heaviness in the world. But mm-hmm. um, if we can continue to create more light, I mean, I don't know. Everything is possible to me. Yeah, I love that. Um I mean, and we are, for sure, we are living in strange times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I, I watched, uh, I guess, in even since the, in the last six months since you posted that Jeremy Finley video, uh, um, the, the futurist guy, um, yeah, yeah. which which was great. It was uh, fascinating. Um, but the, the just the discourse in general is at this very fevered pitch around just the future of humanity itself. Um and we can't even fathom with like, if we talk about like AI and all of these things that it's, we're, yeah, we're living in a very, inter- but you know, somebody said this the other day that, cause I thought it was so daunting at first. I'm like, what's going to happen to the writers? <laughs> what's going to happen to all these things? Um, but then I actually sat with it and I was like, it's interesting. If we think about, you know, I don't know, just in, 
you know, I, I don't know, 60, 70 years ago at this point, or even less, most people were working in factories, right? Mm-hmm. And they were, it was hand labor, they were doing this thing, and then all of a sudden machines come into play, right. and now machines have taken over, and they are, like, we still have people that have jobs, it's mm-hmm. just they've changed. Right. And so I'm kind of, I was like, oh, that's actually a really good way to put it. So it's like, okay, there's now there's management positions. Those people are right. going to have to manage the AI. Like there's, there's, I think, I think it's going to shift, but I don't think it's going to sh- like shift in a way that like wipes out humanity, you know? But I think people can go into the fear of it being so daunting and scary and what's going to happen and all that. Yeah. But I, I think that it's just the next elevation in some way and mm. it's happened. So we got to like go with it instead of resisting it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and whatever, the the technology will get to some point. Um, But I think, you know, a friend of mine had a a really interesting blog post about this, is that a a lot of the fear is actually being generated by the people that are developing the technology, because it's part of the whole hype. So, you know, you have like the red team, who are like dramatically quitting their jobs at the AI companies to talk <laughs> about how dangerous it is. Dangerous it is. And then you have the blue team who's out here saying this is the best thing ever, and you know, and then you know you have the ethics team who got fired. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, but you know the, the like even the fear around it is being generated by the people that are making it because they want more money, probably, um, you know. Mm-hmm. And the the uh, I, I'm not really sure like where we're going to end up with it. Yeah, I don't think we. I'm not sure either. But I, you know, people are like, I think it's going to wipe out actors and writers. I was like, I don't think that's possible. Like, we need human beings. And I would say something like, I don't know, it, this might be just my own limited perspective, but um, I think during the pandemic, because we had such disconnection, mm-hmm. that people want connection they they like to crave it they desire they need it we need it as a like as a humanity i was talking to a friend of mine um the other night who's doing this documentary and he um my friend alex he wrote this amazing book called um the third door and mm. he was talking about how um like suicide and our, in our youth is at like an all-time high mm-hmm. and like because of the lack of connection that we have. And so I think we we desperately need it as a society. And how can we use AI not as a means of disconnection or a means of like um, <laughs> technology taking over, but how do we use it to, to um, create more connection and more mm-hmm. accessibility and more um, connection to humanity? And I, I think we, because of that deep need, I don't think we can take art off the table like we want it built by a human being we don't care about it otherwise that's what art is about that's why we care about it because it's it's the the humanness in it like Mm -hmm. the connection to it the Mm -hmm. the emotion and if we take that out it's no longer art yeah uh you know i mean even like you know people who read books like they follow certain authors because they have a relationship with that person the person that's behind the the books and I, yeah, I mean, I think even if they do try to make AI generated product, and they will, I'm sure. Of course. I, I don't like humans will never stop making art because yeah. we yeah. do it because we need to, not, you know. Yeah, I love there was a phrase that um, someone said once. They're like, um, I'm going to butcher it. It won't be verbatim, but um, something along the lines of I don't make um, film to make money. Mm hmm um i'm like i make film because i love it it's like this you know it's um or it's it, there's some phrase around it but it's it's basically the point being is that it's not i don't make art to make money i'm i make money to make art that was what it was right yeah that vaguely rings a bell but i can't place it yeah so it's just it's a yeah we can't stop making it if you're an artist you got you have to create you have to be the artist mm-hmm yeah. So I, I you know, I, I mean, I I am watching this writer strike with a fair amount of like. Yeah. Um, 
yeah. degradation because you know the the AMTPT is really not coming to the table as a serious partner because I I really think they think oh we can just wait them out and have mm-hmm. AI do it and mm-hmm. you know it's like people say the film industry is dying and it's like yeah and the film industry is the one killing it yeah yeah I I can go into that for days so I'm I'm like I work on I'm on some committees for SAG and you know work with the boards and things and and you know I'm part of all the guilds and so if there's a it's an interesting space to be in to be um in the middle of it and like you're right about the AMPTP like the thing that you know what I'm recognizing is and my hope and I think a lot of the uh, I don't want to speak for all of SAG specifically but the hope for a lot of people is that it shows that we don't need the AMPTP as a negotiating committee like we we as unions we can negotiate for ourselves and we want to work directly with the studios and I um for those who don't know like the AMPTP I think it was uh um put together in like the 70s like Mm -hmm. 72 74 76 something like that um and uh they act as a go-between between the unions and the studios and basically we're like trying to put pressure to be like why we don't need you (laughs) we don't need you to do that for us and i think um the hope is that you know they'll they'll see because they're right now they're losing so much Mm. the fact that it's the writers the actors and the directors on strike right now you can't make anything. And so hopefully, hopefully it'll get resolved and in a fair way. And they'll see, like, I, I was talking to a handful of people about, um, that are, that use AI for business specifically and mm-hmm. how they're writing out all of these, um, these things for them. And and then I have another friend that's in co- like, um, the grad school and was like, oh, I'll just see if it'll write a paper for me. And it was like, and make sure you reference all of these sources AI lied about everything. It made up sources. It like, and then the writing wasn't accurate about like making points. It's you actually can't. It's because what it's doing primarily is it's pulling from top rated sources, which doesn't mean it's accurate because fake news. And so we're in this world where it's like you can use it, but it doesn't mean it's going to be an accurate source. And so you can't. There, I don't think people realize that. Then the studios are not going to be able to use that as a writing source. There's some people need to actually manage that and they need to like, like they can use it as an editing tool, but it's not advanced enough. It doesn't have the emotional capability, nor does it have the, the wherewithal to be like, is this, uh, is this factual? Mm. And wow. so I think um, people don't realize that it's not, it's not as clean as, as you think it is it's not as easy to just be like, let me just, tell AI to write me a script about blank and then it'll be, no, it's just, that's not how it works. Thankfully. (laughs) Right. Uh, Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. Like I, I have, I've experimented with it mainly for like, you know, writing emails. Like I need to like write a cold email about something or whatever. (laughs) Okay. See what it does. And then like put a little personality in it. Totally. Um, you know, but that's the extent of it. And they're shoving it in everything. Like I, as a hobby, like I make my own tea blends. There's mm-hmm. a, there's a website and you go and you pick your stuff in your blend and you make your own art and put it up there. And then you, oh, know, you can order yes. your tea. You'll have um, to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a craft nut. I have okay. like 50 ba- boxes of like tea things and uh, lotion. Oh my God. All right. Yeah, I, I will. I'll send it to you after. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so like this is this is like a fun, fun thing I do. Like I make tea for whatever. Like my friend just, uh, you know, a author friend came by on the show and I made a tea for, you know, her main character and mm-hmm. sent it to her as a little gift. And, you know, it was really fun and it's just a nice thing. And now there's, you know, when you go on the make your own blend page, there's like, here's our tea AI. And if you tell it what you want your tea to be about, it'll like make the blend for you and come up with an image. And I'm like, wow, you guys like don't understand. That's oh, like so sucking funny. the fun out of. Yeah. <laughs> what you know what we're doing yeah 
Like that actually defeats the entire purpose of what I wanted to do here, which was right. make tea blend. <laughs> right. It was just, I mean, I can't imagine like, I mean, whatever, I guess somebody's probably using it, but it was just like, wow, you really yeah. don't, don't understand. You yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people will start to see that in a big way. They'll start to see that there's um, you know, my hope. I have another friend that like wrote a book around how, like, I don't know, just around technology and how it's affecting our our mental health mm. and all these things. And mm-hmm. I, I think it's really, it's true. And we need, there's something that needs to be done. And I, I do, th- I'm hoping that maybe this will be a catalyst for people to see that it's, um, it can be detrimental if not, if there isn't some kind of, I don't know, legislation, something around, you know, how it's being used. Yeah. I don't know. I can go on about this for a long time. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, it's definitely like... It's, I mean, it's it's the time period we're living in, right? It is. It is. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I have my doubts about legislation just because that moves slowly. And, I, you know, I feel like, no, this just has to be, this has to come from just social pressure. Yeah. I think. Like, it just has to be, you know, universally understood that you don't use this in certain ways. You know, it's interesting. I've like I heard about a handful of, like, young kids also kind of rejecting technology mm. because they know. And I'm like, maybe, like, the next generation is going to really understand the toxicity of certain aspects and re- reject and resist it. I, I saw this article about how kids went from like, sm- took, like got rid of their smartphones and then just had like the old like flip phone. Flip phones. Oh my God. Yes. Right? You know, flip phones. Um, and, and I was just like, be, so they could not have apps or anything and they couldn't feel, wouldn't feel tempted. And I was like, that's brilliant. And they did it on their own. Mm. And I was like, I don't know who knows, maybe the next generation, just like we have, you know, the Z gens are fighting for, you know, our, our world literally and fighting, um, you know, against climate change and all of that. And I think maybe the next generation is fighting against technology. Who knows? There's, we don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens, how this all unfolds. I, I, for one, welcome our, our Gen Z overlords. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, it look like we all have our are are what what generation I'm assuming millennial. Me? Um I'm uh I'm actually Gen X. Okay, got it. So I feel like each each like one has some their own unique thing. Like I'm a millennial and it's just mm. We got our stuff, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. And then Gen, I've heard this thing about like Gen Zers how they um, either are making millions of dollars somehow, like not doing not with without a normal job, right? <clears throat> or have no drive whatsoever and don't want to work because their millennial parents or their you know Gen X parents take care of them. <laughs> what I, I mean, what I've seen because I still have a foot in that sort of professional office world culture. Oh, do you? Um, I, mean- I do. Yeah. Well, I do like graphic design and visual arts, oh, yeah. like on like a corporate level. And as, as I still have a foot in that world, like what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of Gen Z kids that, you know, want to work, they want to have jobs, but they're just not there to put up with a job that doesn't treat them well enough i love that you know that's such an interesting thing is i was talking about this is going to take us on a baby tangent but i won't mm-hmm. go too far into it but that's cool. um i was talking about how like millennials specifically mm-hmm. like i feel like we were the last generation of like yes we have cyberbullying and different things but the last generation of like true bullying in the sense that um now like the gen zers like mm-hmm. If someone comes out as queer, like when I was a kid, it wasn't acceptable. Like it wasn't accepted. It was yeah. made fun of. Mm-hmm. You couldn't be entirely who you who you are, who you were. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's this piece around like we've been fighting to like be in acceptance fully 
of the entirety of who we are, queerness, whatever it is, it's true for us, right? And, um, and then the Gen Zers, they're like, be you, celebrate you. Like, there's just like a, a different level of celebration of people's uniqueness. And I just, I'm just, I was blown away by that. Like people fighting against bullying and, um, and yeah. I was like, that was not my generation. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, certainly not right. mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was so bullied when I was a kid. I was like, that's, so I just, yeah, I'm, it's, it's inspiring. It's inspiring yeah. to see. So I understand why they would not accept not being treated fairly. Cause they're like, no, we, we deserve to be treated with respect and like, yes, you do. Yes, we do. <laughs> well, it's something yeah. Learned about yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. You know, it's like, it, it, I find that people my age and older tend to sort of like to, to, bust on them as the the tide pod generation you remember that thing with kids eating tide pods yeah, um, I heard about that, yeah 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 that was like a few years ago at this point but um but yeah i mean i i see a lot of really smart kids in that generation you know my son is 17 and oh, oh, what a great age yeah he's um you know like his group his friend group had you know a, a kid come out as trans and you know decide they wanted he him pronouns and you know their reaction was uh, okay so, so are we going to play D D next weekend yeah that was it see i love that i just got chills <laughs> see i love that so much and the, that makes me so happy that makes yeah. me so I just, you know, uh, there's a friend of mine, author friend of mine, who is a sci-fi author, and she has specifically gotten into doing this sort of subgenre called hope punk. Hmm. And I'm so, I'm so here for it. It's just about like how do we get our act together as a species? How do we connect and find each other? And you know, it's like if the standard story is like, you know, the dragon is burning the towns and the farms and so a bunch of people get together and go fight the dragon like the hope punk version of that is the dragon is burning the towns so a bunch of people go and find go and find the dragon and talk to it and find out what's wrong with it and realize that there's some unmet need and they they wow. you know <laughs> that makes me so happy oh my god i love that so much i was just talking to somebody about this last night um um my good friend ben who like we both have a bit of a following and we were talking about if we ever got any um anyone like trolls or people that are just like saying really negative mm -hmm. things he's like what do you do when that happens and i was like i'm nice to them and i talk to them because clearly they're hurt <laughs> and i've gotten the craziest responses i one time had someone create an i hate jade fan account like and i was like oh they must be really hurt like i wonder what it is that's like so painful for them so i just wrote them a, like a like a thing going hey i'm so sorry if there's anything that i did to offend you mm -hmm. um, it seems like you're hurt by something and like i just want you to know that like you like i'm here if you need any support because mm -hmm. clearly like it, like what you're going through something going through something and you know just so you know if i'm i'm curious like if you were to hear something like that from someone would that hurt your feelings mm -hmm. And then it went from I hate Jade to then he created an I love Jade fan account and changed his entire tune. It was like, I'm so sorry. I was having such a hard time. And then like, and I was just a little bit, like, I mean, it doesn't really matter about the details, but mm -hmm. I think the point being is that we don't realize how much people just need a little bit of love and care and what literally what can change from hate to love. It's true. It's true. And, you know, and honestly, I have lots of days where I don't have the grace to, to come in with that. Uh, but when I have, it's been interesting. Like, it it hasn't always worked, but sometimes it has. I you love know. that. There's been moments, like, there was a LinkedIn post or something where they came out with, like, those darker shade band-aids. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, somebody posted about that and was really emotional about it, was yeah, really having him some feelings about that. And, you know, there were some people kind of being stupid about it. And what's a big deal? Da, 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 da. And I just said to this one guy, like, OK, it's your right to be this person. But why do you want to? Yeah. This yeah. Is, you know, this is something that doesn't affect you, but it does affect other people. And 
If totally. you're happy about it, let them be happy. Why do you have to be the guy that pees in the punch? <laughs> the pees in the punch. I love that. I love that. I might use that phrase. Um, true. And and we have no idea what that experience was like for someone that didn't have a, a band-aid that was of their skin color their whole lives. Right. So you can't speak into something that you don't know about. So why not celebrate and support someone in their feelings? Like that to me is like what it's all about. It's like mm. support someone in their truth and their feelings and their emotions. And the fact is you can't, you can't possibly empathize if you're not a person of color to be, to have, and you've had your skin color band-aids your whole life to know mm. what it's like to feel honored in that way and to feel celebrated in that way. You just can't. Yeah. So don't speak on it if you don't. But Amen. <laughs> um all right so i want to i do want to get to the magician's questions because we're, sure. we're gonna we're gonna run out of time soon i don't want to keep you i love and, i love talking to you so we can talk all day <laughs> um but uh i do want to ask about um i want to ask what your way in was with her to the character I was like, did you mean like literally like act like audition? Like, one? As, well, no, I mean, as an actor, like when you, when yeah. you got the script and you were looking at her, like, okay, how do I, you know, it's, it's interesting. So I, all I, I would say it's never the same, but it, but it is, there's certain aspects of me where I'm like, I need to find X, Y, Z to understand this person mm -hmm. i do i'm gonna get just like a little nerdy because no, we can't go for it yeah we podcast and we should um <laughs> um so i i've studied every form of acting because i i think and just like goes back to the core of like what we've talked about i don't believe in one way i don't believe that it's like one size fits all for everyone i think it's like what fits for you. So I've taken little pieces from all of these different acting styles, like um, Meisner, which is more instinctual. Uh, that's something that I think was more innate for me. But then I, I really love Stella Adler backstory work because and I've worked with, um, you know, um, Deborah Cole and John Heinemann and John Heinemann has been uh, my teacher for many years around it and was one of the, uh, Deb was one of um, Stella Adler's protégés. And so she was like such a stickler about backstory. And so it just got deeply ingrained in me. And I was like, because again, we talk about the pathology of a character, the more we understand their mm -hmm. life experience, the more we understand how they are in the present moment, just, just as we would understand ourselves, the more we can understand our past, the more we can understand our present and the more we can re like create the future that we want to live. And so <clears throat> Um, I think for me, it was a couple things, and this is a funny one, but I always need to understand their physicality first. Mm. Like I need to understand their walk, how they feel in their body. Mm. And, um, and sometimes the backstory work comes first and then it's like, I land, but for me, the, her physicality came first. Mm. It was like this. I just knew her in my cells and it was like, a really interesting thing. And then I was doing all this backstory work, where she came from, what her life experience was like. And the interesting piece is I got to play fully because yes, she was Asmodeus and she was, you know, Amanda Orloff, which was um, the original character. And then she expanded into Katie Orloff Diaz, but <clears throat> there was not really any information about her. Hmm. And it was like, when I got the script, mm -hmm. so did everybody else. Like, and so I got to really create this like very detailed backstory of who she was, not based on anything, but my own imagination. So that was really fun to play with. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that she was going to be Asmodeus until much later. And so th there, that wasn't a piece that I was pulling from either. So I just got to be like, okay, well, this is where she comes from. She like, she has a toughness to her. She's, she's not <clears throat> the, like the book smart kind. She is the, the worldly, the world like has been through the ringer, gone through trauma, gone through challenges. And so how does that land in someone's body? How does that have someone react to the world? Mm -hmm. Like she's 
she's seen more than most people should have. And, and of course there's like a protectiveness to her, but I think at the core of it, I was like, but I think underneath there's such a soft heart that she's protecting. Yeah. And we see that a lot with people that have like a tough bravado. I'm like, well, what are you trying to protect? Because clearly like you're so tender and you're so sensitive underneath of that. Yeah. And so I, I found her heart and then on top of that was like, well, then what is she protecting? How does she want to protect that heart? Mm. Because she's been wounded so much that she doesn't want to feel that anymore. And and she clearly like loves her mom and is like trying to protect. She tried to protect everyone. Mm. Didn't always do it in the best methods, but at like what at the core of it, it was it was from a, a level of care. Mm. And I try not to pull from my my personal life, but I couldn't help but be like, oh, I relate to it because of. Mm. And um, I think about my dad, who's like a very, he's one of the toughest people you'll ever meet. I'll just say that. He was um, he was in the Israeli Army Special Forces. Mm -hmm. So right. to, to, I'll just leave it at that. So very, very extreme, aggressive, like strong-willed human being. And um. I could always see like there's like this soft, tender heart underneath of this strong, protective, aggressive masculine. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. There's like pieces of that. And so um, like there was this running joke with myself and our executive producer, one of our executive producers. We had John McNamara and Sarah Gamble, of course, John McNamara. Um, he had this joke with me. He would call me IDF which is his Israeli Defense Force, because my dad was in the Mossad. And then I would- well, and, and you know Krav Maga, don't you? You know Krav Maga, yeah. 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 Um, actually in the process of belting up, which I'm very excited about. Anyways, um, but so I wanted to pull from the toughness that I knew lived in me, both physically and otherwise, mm -hmm. because I think we need to understand it, but I also didn't want to pull it from me. And so it was like this balance of how do I- deeply understand it in my bones. Mm. And I think that comes into like backstory work, but also I was like, and I was also like, and I know the physicality and the toughness that it takes mm. to be this character and to be this person. So I could go on about it for a long time, but it, there was a lot of, a lot of ways. And then I will say, and I want to give a shout out to our, our late great costume designer, Magali. She was amazing. Sadly, she she passed away a few years back and um just want to honor her because the moment the moment i put the clothes on i was her mm. and that and she had this gift she had this gift of really creating that for people the moment they they like literally it was like putting on their skin i got to put on her skin and i and i knew her i knew who she was i felt in her skin in her blood like i just so i just wanted to say that it, it also takes the village of like people that help to to bring it to life the costume designers art departments the the writers the creators you know everyone so i hope that answers the question uh yeah that absolutely um <laughs> yeah i i think that it's i love uh, it's very interesting that the physical part of it was so much of it for you and um yeah yeah, that's not always the case, but with her, like as a physical kid, mm -hmm. she and having those the battle magic and the physical abilities, right? I, it had to it had to start physical, right? Um, so obviously, um, from where I sit, her relationship with her mother was like a very formative, painful, difficult, but very formative relationship for her and you know i wrote that poem about it which was just you know whatever little head cannons on my part um it's so much it's so yeah. beautiful i really want you to read it but please so please share it with people so they can hear it it's so good um but it and that so that was just my own little head cannon about like there was probably some moment like that in her childhood but what i would love to know from you with your Stella Adler background is what kind of little stories did you tell yourself about that relationship in particular? Yeah. You know, <clears throat> it was interesting. I, 
so we we know that she Katie ended up be like becoming addicted and um and always had you know some some issues around that and there were aspects of that that I I made as like a, a relatable thing to her mom like it was actually partly her way of connecting to her mom and I had her, um I had written pieces around how she was actually like picking her mom off the floor, picking her mom up off the floor from either drug addiction or doing, cause she was also addicted to magic. We saw that. And, and, um, and so there was this, this aspect of Katie always having to pick, pick her up and having to take care of her. And so she was never taken care of. Mm. And, um, and I also could relate to that too. And so I uh, creating this story around like, what is it like to, to need to have parents and need to have someone guiding you and showing you and then having to fight for yourself and having to be that independent. And so just like these little, and I love the, like the little nuanced moments because it's not like the big moments that people remember. It's those little details. So I remember, um, like her being nine years old and like writing this whole story about her being nine years old and um, like needing to find her parent and like, and needing to find her mom and um, couldn't find her anywhere. And she didn't have food and she's waiting for a, a day and she doesn't know what to do. And she finally like figures it out and she goes and she steals, you know, she steals an apple from like this outside market and, mm and finds her mom like just drugged out on the floor and then has to take care of her and then gives her some of the apple. And it's just like, to me that the symbolism of, of feeling like you have to like feed someone the little bit of life you have just for the sake of connection. Mm. And, um, and there's like an independence that comes and there's so many little, little stories like that, that I think were just um, to me informed. Oh, how does she, how does she feel like she can't trust and rely on anybody to take care of her and to feed her? Mm. So of course she runs from Penny at the beginning and is like, I did this just to use you. Like when we could right. see we could clearly see that underneath of that, there was also love and there was so much care, but there was so much fear around if I care for someone, a, they're going to, they're going to leave me mm -hmm. like, you know, and then, um, and then B, they're not going to actually take care of me. Right. And then we see that, unfortunately, we see that happening over and over again to her. Like in some way, shape or form, they leave. Yeah. Like the people that she loved, they, they're gone. Yeah, her story is rough. Yeah, it's rough. It's really rough. But I think like to me what i loved and i i got this a lot on the show and it was, it was like the mo the greatest gift in my life but the fact that it allowed people to relate to something in the sense that like there are people that have rough life experience i was one of them you know like and to feel like there's a character or a person i can relate to that's gone through it that has survived and has thrived in some way, shape or form. And it's like, might be still struggling, but they're still making it and they they're finding their way and they're learning to find their power. And we, we see by the end, she's fully found her power and her strength and, mm -hmm. and her purpose really. And, and so to me to go through and to come from what she did mm -hmm. to finding that empowerment, it's like, what a gift. And I, and I think to, alive had a lot of people say it was so inspiring to me because like I experienced these things. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's all I want is for people to feel like I, I can relate and understand. And I, um, I don't feel alone anymore in that. Yeah. yeah. Well, definitely what attracted me to, to her character was just the fact that she was such a survivor and, you know, that she kept going through these things and she would still come out and, you know, still keep going. Mm -hmm. um you know that that seems to be a character type that i am drawn to a lot mm -hmm. i have to ask though because she does go through some stuff um yeah, over does. the course of the show yeah. like actually what's funny i just mm -hmm. looked down i just have to share okay this was my season four book uh, of uh haiti stories i just like looked down and saw oh, it oh wow yeah oh yeah 
yeah so i just that was interesting yep look at that so i'm like oh sweet (laughs) so yeah yeah, in books Um, of just waiting (laughs) see i you know i think probably that there there are fans out there that would pay a lot of money to know what was in those books (laughs) i might post them i don't know i was like actually i should look back and see um yeah it's there's there's definitely some interesting points in here I'll I'll share some with you at some point. Um, anyways, you're gonna ask though. <laughs> um, well, what I was gonna ask is, um, with so much, you know, with her going through so much trauma, um, was there anything that did you have to like protect yourself emotionally in any way when you were kind of going through periods where she was suffering a lot? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I think there's it's an interesting piece because I think a lot of people don't talk about. I can go way far into this and i um, happy to talk as long as you need, but, but it's just, it's a, like a, it's a really big topic for me. I, when you think about things like Heath Ledger, for example, and when you're, when you're taking on a character so fully, so completely, we don't realize the psychological effects that that can have on someone. Right. And, um, and I mean, I've, I've seen it on a lot of shows that I've been on where people actually have mental, like psychotic breaks mm-hmm. because they, they stop understanding the distinction between themselves and the character. Mm. And I don't know if it's just because of how I've, you know, experienced life or what, but it, it, I've always had a practice Mm. of like closing out the day. Like it's like when I'm taking off her clothes, it's as if I'm like putting it aside reminding myself having a practice of like reminding myself of who I am and like letting that stuff go doing like I get a little spiritual with it but I do like energy work around like energy clearing to make sure that I'm like that's her stuff this is me like let me come back to myself because it is really heavy but I to be honest it, it also can be very healing and I don't I I don't I hesitate to say that because we don't ever want it to be like oh acting is therapy because it's not (laughs) for those listening. It's not, don't treat it as such. Um, But when we allow ourselves to be expressed, Mm -hmm. that can be healing. And I think the, the process of understanding her and being able to experience or um, heal from some of the painful things that she went through, it reminded me as a human that I could also do it and overcome it. And I realized, like, I found a lot of my own personal strength Mm. by playing her and being her. Mm. And so I would say that it was both. It was like on uh, some days and some levels, like those, those moments where she was, it was really dark and she was going through it. I really had to make sure I was removing myself. And there were times where I faltered and I was like sad for days. I was like, why do I feel this way? Oh yeah, this this isn't, I'm still in Katie land. (laughs) And had to like come back to myself. And then there's times where I'm like, I was so deeply inspired and moved and empowered by getting to be in her skin. Cause I was before playing Katie, I was more of a people pleaser than I would like to admit. And I was like always trying to be nice to everyone, even if they were being shitty to me. <laughs> And, and so I was like, oh, actually, this is not appropriate. Their behavior is not okay. And I'm like, I'm learning that from Katie. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, there's, so there was both, I would say, um, yeah, there were days where it was hard. And then I needed to come back to me. And there were days where I was really empowered and inspired by her. Ooh. That's terrific. That, yeah, that's, she she gave you a little gift there. She Oh, my God, she gave me so many gifts so many gifts yeah i really i feel like i found found myself and i also got to live out like my rebellious 14 year old 13 year old child through her (laughs) which was also probably healing in and of itself (laughs) oh that sounds like a treat yeah it was anyway so did you bring anything for show and tell um so well i yeah i well give me one second it's over here in the corner (laughs) <laughs> okay. I have a whole box which does maybe helps you, maybe doesn't, but an entire what? so the unfortunate thing is um not unfortunate, but okay. when I got a lot of little 
fun things. This is actually not from the show itself. This is from one of our, um, our premieres. Mm. But I, a lot of our fans, they bought our stuff. <laughs> we didn't know that. So we, when the show was closing, we didn't know that they were selling our stuff. So we didn't get a lot of things. Oh what I God. did get was a lot of gemstones, which here's another one. So I'm going to show you my favorite gemstone that was not stolen. Okay. It was gifted. <laughs> okay. All right. But this not, is, I'm not going to narc on you if it was this stolen. This is my but... favorite gemstone. Oh, that's really cool looking. Actually. This is called Labradorite. So this is my, my favorite one there. Um, and then I was going to show you this piece. So this is kind of an interesting one. Um, I actually, this was in Dean Fogg's office. Oh, I think I remember that thing. And on the back, mm -hmm. it's have no regrets for yesterday's past. Anticipate tomorrow for it holds your dreams. Celebrate today as it is a wondrous gift. And I actually ended up finding where they had this. And I got this for people for a wrap gift for one of the years. So I just oh. loved some of their little, little oh. chalkies. Oh, and then, I mean, again, I won't go through all of these because there's too many things. But one year, I made as a wrap gift, I made magicians' cards for people, like playing cards. Oh my god! So I got them hand handmade, which I'm just very proud of. That's awesome. I have, a couple, I have I think I have two packs left that I'm like holding on to, and then I have so many like just cute fan things that they've like made over the years, which is oh. just so Oh. Like all these Katie things so there's a ton but oh. I wish I had more stuff from from the show so fans out there if you have stuff and you're like I don't need this which I doubt is ever going to happen but <laughs> stranger <laughs> things have happened stranger things have happened this is true but yeah they made us all sorts of beautiful fun wrap gifts like one year they did um, like these cards with all of the not all, but um, this is a bunch of tarot, uh, tarot things. So they gave us like some beautiful, beautiful gifts over uh, the years. That I know a lot of people that would want one of those. Right? I know this is great. I should probably take in more of those. And then I'll just show you my, my last one. This one's one of my favorite gifts that we got. So this is the Fillory and Further book. Okay. Wait for it. It's more of a Dean Fogg. <laughs> gift oh so. my gosh that's amazing <laughs> isn't that great that is so <laughs> i have a couple of those um gave one to my mom probably shouldn't have she doesn't need it <laughs> but yeah so those are some of the the many trinkets i have but some of these some of these are like the, the favorites because it's yeah. just a, but like that's just on its own merits that's just like a beautiful piece of things right you know, just to have yeah oh, yeah cool. i feel grateful but literally boxes and boxes of of beautiful little trinkets from over the years and just like things that fans have made like made me a little i don't know if you can see that well but oh yeah they made you a little funko a little funko pop yeah that's my my now friend um, Matt Boccia, who was, yeah, anyways, dear, dear. So that's, that's how you know you've arrived when you have your own Funko. <laughs> right? I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. I'm grateful. So, yeah, lots of, lots of little trinkets. All right. So, one last thing. Like, normally yeah. I do like a lightning round thing at the end of the show, but today I'm just going to ask uh, one little thing, which is what's one piece of media that you've consumed it could be a movie tv show book whatever but one thing that you've consumed recently that you really liked what was it would you like would you not like oh you know it's it, this so there's so many things that <laughs> I was like which one do i, I want to talk about because i could there's like the books and then there's the the media um I'm going to say um, it's a classic for me. It's a book that I came back to. Okay. 
Um, I wouldn't say that there's anything I didn't like, which is challenging because it's so, I don't know if you experienced this, but when you have something that feels just really nostalgic, Mm. you can't really find like a flaw in it, even though there might be flaws. (laughs) I don't know. That's how I operate. I'm like, for example, I don't know. I was going to reference a really silly movie for me, but like hook, hook, people will go back and be like, oh, there's flaws. I'm like, no, it is a flawless Flawless, nostalgic childhood movie. It was no. what made me want to be an actor. You know, You're I'm kidding. Just, wow. Yeah, well, was great, Hook was a great movie, man. Thank you. Well, the reason why it did was because um, I I was so young at the time when it came out, mm-hmm. but one of the kids uh, in my class was a lost boy. And so then I realized mm-hmm. that you could actually like act. I was like, you can do that? And then I was obsessed because I was like, I realized that that was something that you could do and get like as a, for a living. And I was like, oh, I want to do that the rest of it. <laughs> Anyways. And then the little girl things on it. It was a whole thing. What were you going to say? Well, you know, it was funny. I just saw like a reel on Instagram recently or something where uh, Dustin Hoffman and uh, who was it that played Smee? Oh, oh gosh. Do you I'm remember? So t- I do. I remember, and it, it's not coming to me in this moment. But All I, right. well, maybe, whatever. Yeah, yeah. The, the two of them like read the script, and they were like, "Okay, we're going to play this like they're a gay couple." That's amazing. I didn't realize that. I love that. And now I'm like, okay, I got to go back and watch Hook now because. I mean, honestly, though. I just like thinking about it. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. That's really right. fun. Yeah. And do you know that little that Glenn Close was in it? I don't remember that. So this is a, like a fun little snippet that most people don't realize. I love that we're going okay. off on a tangent okay. right now. Yeah. So do you remember the boo box where one of the pirates at the beginning mm-hmm. gets put in the box and with the scorpions? Okay. It's Glenn Close. Oh my god! It's been close in drag. Oh my god! That's amazing. Yeah. So, for people watching, you have to go back and watch Glenn Close go in the boo box. It's really yeah. it was such a fun little cameo. But yeah. well, this is apparently this is the universe telling me that I need to go back and rewatch Hook. So yeah, yeah there we go. There I mean, go. Every, every now and then, it's just to me, it's just like childhood joy. And I think you can't go wrong with that. And we need a little bit more of that lightness and that lighthearted joy. But I was going to say the book that I I started going back to and reading again recently is what was my favorite childhood book. And people are probably going to be like, you read that when you were a child? Because <laughs> it's just not really a childhood book. But The Silstein Prophecy. And um, it's this book. It has like these fantastical elements to it and kind of talks about like energy and magic and these mm-hmm. really beautiful ways um and uh it was my first taste of fantasy meets reality Mm -hmm. and so I was like oh this was my favorite book when I was like 12 11 12 whatever it was Mm -hmm. and it's amazing to see how like there's little aspects of that that have now been implemented into my life and Mm -hmm. how magically appeared in certain ways so mm-hmm. I was like I need to go back and read this so I started reading it I was like this it's just like such a such a unique and magical book but it really to me it also and this is what I love about the magicians it reminds us of our own magic mm-hmm. and our own ability and the magic that we that's around us in the world mm-hmm. and so if you haven't read it Celestine Prophecy it's a special book it rings a bell for me yeah that's it really a, it's so. Isn't it interesting when you go back and like look at something from a long, long time ago, like from your childhood, and you're like, oh, this explains so much about who I am as a person. A thousand percent. And also like hook, because I'm a goofball. And I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it's so funny on the show, just like one more little magician snippet. We always had this running joke about how like everyone on the show was just like their character, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> like we're like oh yeah alice olivia pretty similar um hale and elliot yeah similar uh 
Summer and Margo. Yeah, pretty similar. <laughs> and they're like, Katie and Jade, nope. <laughs> like, and then when people meet me in person, they're like, I didn't really recognize you. And I'm like, yeah, I smile more in person. <laughs> just, you know, That's it's just fun. funny. Well, you know, uh, Summer did a poem for me also. Really? Yeah. Oh, I love that. And, and it was like, wow, okay, yeah, it just is Margot. Right, right. <laughs> I love that. I was just talking about her the other day going, it was um, just how we get the scripts, right? But Summer brought Margot to the page. Like she, mm. she, cause you can just like read a line and it's like, um, I'm trying to think of one of Margot's quippy, you know, one-liners, but she's like over, over up, right? Let's just say use that one. Like some people want to just be like over up. But the way that she goes, she says it is like with such fervor and such like it's so pointed and and unique that it makes it stand out in a way that we wouldn't think. And so like she brought such a gift in that. I mean, all the all the actors, and that does not you know take away from the incredible writing. It's just there's there's a, a uniqueness to how the how each of the actors brought. Um, mm -hmm brought the dialogue to life and summer being one of them wow. yeah okay so mm. um i could go on for half an hour know, same, more same, same. <laughs> um, i'm gonna do a little sign off and uh you know it was, some, such a pleasure chatting yeah, with you. it was it was so much fun thank you so much for coming on my pleasure um, anytime truly such a gift and i'll send all the stuff over and whatever sounds hey. good Yay. Um so yep. Yeah. So um this has been our show, you beautiful nerds. Thank you for listening. Check out the links in the description below to follow Jade's incident and keep up with all the amazing things she's up to. If you haven't watched The Magicians, for gosh sakes, go do it. All five seasons are on Netflix. As ever, the Geek Girls have all the goodies for you. So for best results, insert in brain. Take care, take it easy, and stay geeky.